It's another edition of Time About the Movies. We're looking at the movies of September 20th, 1991. Seven movies to look at, and we're going to start off with some movies that are not quite as memorable. But, uh, I'm not going to waste any more time with it. Let's just get right on into it. Let's start with that first movie, and that is Late for Dinner. Years have been frozen with Frank. But critics are raving about Late for Dinner. Oh, that's good. Irresistible. Oh, this is, oh, this is weird. Absolutely delicious. A charming and tender love story. I came back for you. An enjoyable, romantic comedy. Forever joy. Late for dinner. I have my head in the fridge there. Start to feel old again. Rated PG. Starts Friday at a theater near you. I get the feeling that Mel Gibson saw this movie and said, I could probably do this movie maybe a little bit better because he pretty much did the same thing with Forever Young where you have a guy who was like frozen in time for a long period of time then he comes back into the modern age and it falls in love and I don't know it's a concept that has a lot of good ideas to potentially work but neither that movie nor this movie I don't think really does it all that well the ideas are there I think the acting is very good with these got with the actors they have Brian Wimmer Peter Berg Marsha Gay Harden uh Peter Gallagher uh, a good cast overall here, but I don't know. The execution in this one didn't really pan out as well. Despite the great actors they have involved here, it felt kind of generic. It felt very formulaic. It felt like a script that you kind of knew where everything was going to go. And it, it was a movie that just really didn't work for me. It, it was one of those movies that I was really looking forward to when I heard, it's a long time ago when I first heard about it. And then when I finally got to see it recently, it was just like... Yeah, this really didn't live up to the expectations that I thought it, I had coming into it. But, um, it's not a bad movie. It's just one that's just kind of there. It's just kind of like vapor. You watch it once, and then you immediately forget about it a day or two later. And that's pretty much what happened with this particular movie. So, not after a great start here with Late for Dinner, but uh, surely we'll get better with our next movie, and that is Living Large. Well, Dexter Jackson wanted to be on TV. How's he ever going to be an anchor man? Then he got his shot. I'm Charles Hempstead, coming to you live. <laughs> now we have no anchor. We'll all miss it. The sniper did, but we will. Stay with the homeboy. Dig it. Now he's going from streetwise to high rise. You the man. No, you the man. Living Large, a comedy about making it. Do you believe that? Rated R. Starts Friday, September 20th at theaters everywhere. What the hell was that? I mean, I I got nothing on this one. I don't know what this movie was trying to be. I don't know who wrote this. I, this writer I've never even heard of. This is directed by the guy who did The Last Dragon. I mean, that was a fun movie in its own right, but I don't know what the hell is going on with this movie. I mean, this feels like a movie that's intended for... A more, intended more for an African American audience, but it's also trying to be more mainstream so that people of other colors and other races can go into it and enjoy it. And I don't think anybody would want to see that after watching this tease. This, it's not just the TV spot that I just showed you. I watched the trailer for myself. The trailer's even more ridiculous. It's just, it's a concept that maybe could work in, in the, under the right hands. I mean, they have a decent director here who has made some decent stuff, but. The script just feels like something that was manufactured from a studio that's trying to appeal to a younger generation, and they just don't know how to do it. It's like it's like with any corporation. They try the lowest common denominator to appeal to a younger generation or a generation of a different race or a different color or different uh, religion, all that type of stuff, and it's just like... It just doesn't. It just doesn't work, and it shows when it doesn't work, where there's no real effort there to put it, like... Get a real writer to make something like this, and maybe you'd have something, but this just looks terrible on so many levels. I mean, I got nothing on this one. I mean, it, it like I said, it looks terrible. So, yeah, probably not going to watch that one anytime soon. Uh, with that said, let's go ahead and move on to our next movie. And now we're talking, it's McBain. He's one of the most respected citizens in the state, McBain. And yet you ran his limo off a cliff, broke the necks of three of his bodyguards, and drove a bus to his front door? Well, Cap and I have proof that he's head of an international drug cartel. I don't want to hear it, McBain. You're out of here. <laughs> that makes two of us. Oh, how I wish it was that, McBain. I mean, that would have been more incredible, but, um... 
Nope, it's a different McBain, but um, hey, at least you got Christopher Walken in here. I mean, he never usually does turns in a bad performance, so how bad could this possibly be? I've been expecting you. It is the right of the people to provide for the common defense. Does this rebel army have any money? It's not enough. It is the right of the people to promote the general welfare. This is our annual fundraising drive, and we would like you to contribute $10 million. It is the right of the people to rise up. What the f do you want? Money. Money? You guys sure kill a lot of people for a little money. It is the right of the people to bear arms. To wage war. set a country free. And this is why you need Christopher Walken to be weird in nearly every single movie is in, because when you try to give him a straight performance, it turns into this movie. I mean, this was just... This is just a lousy movie on so many levels. It's not just Walken that's bad in this. Unfortunately, you also have uh, Maria Kachina and Lonzo, who's a great action actress from the time... Uh, Michael Ironside's also in here. Uh, there's potential here, but just the script... This, it's another generic script. It's a really bad script that doesn't really do anything to make it anything special out of it. It's just go in there, do a typical action movie, cliched, riddled film. Let me rephrase that. Do a cliched, riddled action movie, a typical cliched, riddled action movie, and then, boom, there you go. And it's just... The sad part is... This was actually, this, the name McBain originally came from The Simpsons. And even though this movie didn't do well whatsoever, they, is they were actually told to not use the name McBain for The Simpsons it's during this time period. I don't know if that's when they came up with the actor who played who played McBain, Rene, Re, it's Rainier Wolfcastle, Toy Boat, Toy Boat, <laughs> uh, Rainier Wolfcastle. But, um... It's weird because there was that brief period where they couldn't use the name McBain, but guessing that, but obviously that didn't last very long because they pretty much used it after this movie came out and flopped at the box office. And really, I don't have any more to say about this one. This is just a bad, bad movie. It's just, it's bad for because it's just a, it's not just a bad cliche riddled action film, but it's, it's a toned down Christopher Walken performance. And I'm sorry, Christopher Walken's usually the best when he's playing that weird, cra chaotic, crazy person in mo movies. Like, any time he gives a, cr a good, cr crazy, cr weird, chaotic performance, it automatically makes the movie a little bit better. I mean, The Country Bears would not be enjoyably fun as it is if it wasn't for Christopher Walken having a huge part in that movie. And, um, yeah, that's pretty much all i got to say about this one. McBain is, um... Pretty bad, pretty bad. So we're we are definitely not off to a good start this week, but um, we do at least get back into some get into the swing of things with our next movie, and that is Robert Duvall, Diane Ladd, and Laura Dern in Rambling Rose. Love Rambling Rose, the kind of lovable, honest, and unpredictable American movie you never get anymore. Oh, at least. If Robert Duvall isn't already considered the best actor on the planet. This performance should put things in perspective. Stop behaving as if you're a bo peep. Diane Ladd and Laura Dern are likely to grab the first mother-daughter Oscar nominations. <laughs> Rambling Rose, rated R. Starts Friday at selected theaters. Well, I can honestly say that it was certainly a lot better than the last three movies we looked at, but, um... I say that in a good way, because this is a really good movie, and it's largely because of the great performances all throughout the film. You have... The previously mentioned Laura Dern and Diane Ladd. You have Robert Duvall, 
uh, John Hurd from Home Alone, Lucas House. The director of this was Martha Coolidge, who would actually go on to direct a couple of pretty good movies later on in the deck is in this decade, including um, Out to Sea, a very underrated Jack Lemmon and Walter Matthau movie. Uh, she also did the uh, Lost in Yonkers, which came out a couple years later. She also did before this uh, Real Genius and Valley Girl. So she is a good director, and these are two. Ver these are a lot of good performances that are really carrying this movie overall. It's a wonderfully well-made film. Visually, it looks pretty impressive. They do. They did a pretty good job of creating this sepia tone feeling of the 1970s with the, with some of the cinematography they do here. And it is an overall really good movie. It's a well-made film, well-directed, well-acted, well-written. It's a great film. It's a really good film. If you haven't seen Rambling Rose, I can't recommend it enough. Definitely check it out. But we come to easily the best movie that came out this entire weekend, and that is Robin Williams and Jeff Bridges and Terry Gilliam's The Fisher King. Okay, Jack, we're on the air in 5, 4, 3, 2... One. Hey, it's Monday morning, and I'm Jack Lucas. In the world of talk radio, Jack Lucas was king. Look, I said I want an offer they can forget it. To stay on top, he did whatever he had to. Forgive me! But one day, Jack went too far. It was Mr. Lucas's offhand remark that seemed to have fatal impact on Mr. Malnick. No matter what I have, it feels like I have nothing. Yo, what's going on? And just when he was about to give up on his own life, uh, he stumbled into Perry's. Unhand that degenerate and remove your presence! I like New York in June. How about you? You know who I am? Hood ornament. No. I'm a knight on a special quest. A quest. And I need help. Out of your mind! Yes! Now, Jack has to do something he's never done before. Isn't she a vision? I'm deeply smitten. Help someone else. I thought that if I could get him this uh, this girl that he loves, things would change for me. Let's do it right here. Let's go to that place of slender in the yeah, grass. Yeah. Hi, Mrs. Perry. Perry. Perry Perry. No, just Perry. Oh, like Moses. <laughs> I think we will make for each other. <laughs> Scary, but true. Sometimes to find yourself. I'm the janitor of God. You find some pretty wonderful things in the trash. You have to risk it all. Bingo! I'm not doing that. Robin Williams, Jeff Bridges, The Fisher King. I love this guy! Yeah. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, one of the things that strikes you right off the bat is that even if you've never seen a Terry Gilliam movie, you can look at that trailer and see a lot of his cinematic and unique styles of filmmaking that he usually puts into his movies. I mean, even if you've never seen the Monty Python movies, you can definitely tell there is something very different than what you would usually see from a director of this type of film. But, um, really, this really is the best movie that came out this weekend. One of the best movies of the year, no question about it. And it does work in showing that Terry Gilliam is very good, can be very good at directing something outside of his norm. This is one of his first major projects he did outside of the Monty Python series. Uh, this was actually the last film that he did. This was the first film he did after The Adventures of Baron Munchausen. He did it because he was tired of doing big-budget special effects films. And so he did this movie, and it really shows how great of a director he can really be. And it also helps that you have a great script by Richard Lagravanese. Lagra Toy belt. <laughs> I will get it right. Richard Lagravenes. Am I saying that right? Richard Lagravenes. That was close. Richard Lag... Now I can't remember it again. Richard Lagravenes. Richard Lagravenes. Okay. Richard Lagravenes. Okay. So, Richard Lagravenes, who... Writes a really good script, and of course you have all these great performances. Uh, Robin Williams giving another great performance that got him an Oscar nomination. Uh, Jeff Bridges, who gives a really good performance in this, he was unfortunately not he was unfortunately not nominated. Uh, Mercedes Rue, who was not only nominated but she ended up winning Best Supporting Actress, and she really she really does give it her all in this movie. She really is one of the strongest performances of the film. 
you also have Amanda Plummer, Michael Jeter, uh, David Hyde Pierce, Harry Shearer, Kathleen the Jimmy, John Delancey. Just a great cast overall, working with this wonderful script and this great direction by Terry Gilliam. It's just, it's a wonderful film, a very good, well-made film. I can't recommend this movie enough. It's one of the best movies that came out this particular year. Definitely see The Fisher King if you haven't seen it already. It's kind of required viewing, honestly, in my opinion. So uh, with that said, let's go ahead and move on to the next movie, and that is Don Johnson, Melanie Griffith, and Elijah Wood in Paradise. In everyone's life, there is a time that will always be remembered. How long is this kid staying? Not long. Don't expect me to entertain him. For a boy named Willard. Sit down and I'll make you a really nice lunch. That time is now. What are you listening to? Rap. Rap. Yeah. He kills the common man's struggle for survival in a hostile environment. What? He's discovering what it means when two people drift apart. Can't make up my mind. Are you sick of me? Or are you just dead inside? And what it takes to bring them back together. How come you always do that? What? You get me think so hard. It's a good question. It's a very good question. They gave him a summer he'd never forget. Do you love them anymore? He gave them back the love they'd lost. They are so beautiful. Melanie Griffith. Don Johnson and Elijah Wood in Paradise. And another movie that looks like it could have been the ABC TV movie of the week or the CBS, NBC, Fox, Lifetime movie of the week, those type of things. I mean, honestly, it really does feel that way. The director of this, I don't even know what other work she's done. Mary Agnes Donahue. Uh, let me see. I mean, she both... Is, okay, she did one redeemable thing, and that was the script for Beaches. But uh, other than that, though... Yeah, there's really nothing else on her resume that really sticks out, quite honestly. And it's not that the movie is bad or anything. It's just, like I said, it's just another movie that's disguising itself as a t is, as something that it actually is, isn't. Like, it's, like, if you took these actors out and put somebody else in there, or even just put this movie on TV, you really couldn't tell the difference between a TV movie of the week or a theatrical release. And it's, it's a shame, because the really... There could be something good here with this. I mean, these pe these people aren't bad actors. I mean, everybody here is doing their best. I mean, you've got Elijah Wood in here, Thor Birch, uh, Thor Birch, uh, Don Johnson, Melanie Griffith. They've been great actors in the past, and this just this movie just doesn't really work. It's just a movie that, like I said, it just feels like a film that could have been just been on TV for the Sunday night movie of the week and didn't even need to be in a theater and really there's no real reason for this to be in a theater the only reason this was in a theater because uh disney wanted to copy the success of beaches but beaches worked a lot better than this movie did on so many other levels this just feels like a movie that was just a tv movie of the week blown up for the big screen i mean that's really all i gotta say about this one yeah not very good so with that said let's go ahead and move on to the last movie and that is sean penn's the indian runner My brother Frank was due back from Vietnam. We hadn't seen each other since I'd lost the farm in 65. The closeness I felt with my brother was with that rough and tumble kid I knew before high school. He looked like a hero. Hey, 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 don't you do that. Don't you do that. Don't you, do that. you did it. I gotta try and get close to him again. I gotta try. Something. Frankie and Joe have one more chance to make everything right. I miss this, Frankie. I miss having a laugh with you. Me too. One last chance to be brothers. I'm an Indian runner. Bet you can't find me. Yeah! I'll get you. Valeria Golino. Joe, you've done everything you can. Patricia Arquette. I'm married. Dennis Hopper. Do you ever want to kill someone and you don't do it? Because you're afraid. And Charles Bronson. He's a very restless boy, that Frankie. Look at him. And I see this little boy. With his little toy gun milk on. My little brother. Don't you cry. The Indian Runner. So not only was the Sean Penn's 
movie that he directed. This was the first movie he directed as a whole. He would also go on to do movies like Jack Nicholson, with a couple of Jack Nicholson films, I should say, The Crossing Guard and The Pledge. He would do Into the Wild, which I think is his best directorial film, The Last Face and Flag Day. And uh, as you can tell in the trailer, David Morris and Viggo Mortensen played the two brothers in this movie. And um, I haven't seen the movie, so I can't really comment on it, but it looks really good. I mean, like, I don't think Sean Penn is a bad director. I think he's a great actor, too, but... But I think really his strongest film as a director to me was Into the Wild. I thought that movie really worked to his advantages as a filmmaker. And you could definitely see a lot of those elements of Into the Wild in here. And most of the movies he's directed have been okay. They haven't been as good. They haven't been groundbreaking films. Uh, like I said, the real breakout was Into the Wild. But this looks like it could be something a little bit better than some of the other movies he's directed. So... I actually am really looking forward to checking this out one day. I think it can get it on Blu-ray or streaming. Uh, some way I'm going to find a way to watch it because I am curious about it. So uh, there you go. That's my thoughts on the Indian Runner just from that trailer. And so on that note, we wrap up another edition of Time About the Movies. Uh, the next time we meet, we have two movies to look at, including Major League for College Football, Necessary Roughness, and also Goldie Hawn in a very different movie role for her, a thriller called Deceive. So... We will look at both of those movies next time around. But um, until then, thank you guys for watching. And as always, if you want to see more videos like this, check out the playlist on the next page. Check out the previous episode. And I will see you guys tomorrow for another episode. So thank you for watching. I'll see you next time. And until then, as always, take care.